This is a formidable beast. This is an auroch, the ancestor of modern cattle. And I've stood beside this skeleton in a museum in Denmark, and this animal towers way above me. Yet, our ancestors managed to domesticate these aurochs at obviously considerable risk to themselves. The question is why did they take such a risk? The answer is they observed that cattle have this incredible ability to convert grass, which of course we can't eat, um, to highly nutritious milk and meat. And with a bit of processing, foods that we really love to eat, like cheese and yogurts. And these have become very key parts of the diet in some countries around the world. Recently, however, demand for these highly nutritious foods has been increasing incredibly rapidly, way more rapidly than we've ever seen in the past. And this is because our population is growing rapidly, but also with the rising middle class in Asia. Demand is just really, really going very fast. So the challenge for us is how do we meet this rising demand while also reducing the environmental footprint that cattle have on our planet? Traditional breeding just isn't going to cut it here. It served us very well in the past, but it's not going to allow us to meet this demand. We do have a new technology, however, and that new technology is genomics. So genomics, let's start with the genome. To allow you to visualize a cattle genome, let's start with a few tail hairs. And if you take those tail hairs from a cow, you'll see the small follicles on the end of those tail hairs. If you go into those follicles and you take out a single cell, and you take out the DNA from that single cell, what you end up with is a tiny thin white string that is a metre long. And that thin white string consists of three billion A, C, Ts and Gs, just as it does for humans. But somewhere embedded in that genome, those A, C, Ts and Gs, are the genes that affect milk production, beef production, and all the other traits we can look at. So if you compare the genome of two cattle, if you start reading off their genomes, you'll see the vast majority of the genome is actually the same. That's until you come to what we call a single nucleotide polymorphism, or a SNP. And this is just a difference in the genome code. So one cow might carry a G, and another might carry a C. And through the work we've done, we know that there are about 80 million of these differences if you start reading off the sequences of large groups of cattle. Another part of the genome revolution, though, is being able to get this information really cheaply and easily. And that's where these SNP chips come in. So these are small glass slides that will assay the genome of your cattle at 50,000 points. So they don't read off the entire genome, but they allow you to take a snapshot of the genome at 50,000 points along that genome. So if you take your DNA from your cow, you run it across one of these glass slides, what you get back is 50,000 A, C, Ts and Gs the snapshots through the genome. That's a lot of information, but how are we going to use it to increase milk and meat production, to meet this rapidly growing demand? So that's where this technology of genomic selection comes in. So the way genomic selection works is you need a very large population of, say, cattle measured for the trait you're interested in, like milk production. So you have them measured for milk production. You also have them genotyped for these 50,000 snapshots through the genome using these small glass slides. 
then what you can do at each of those snapshots, you can ask, is there a difference in milk production between those cows that carry the A versus the T, for example? And if you do find a difference between the group of cows that carry the A and the group of cows that carry the T, what you have is evidence that that um, mutation, that snapshot, is tracking a gene that affects milk production. One of the things we've realised um, after a great amount of work is there's not just one gene affecting traits like this, affecting milk production or beef production. In fact, there's thousands across the genome. So we actually need these 50,000 snapshots through the genome to track all these different genes affecting milk and meat production. But once we've worked out the effect of these snapshots through the genome, really what genes are they tracking, then we're really in business. Because it means we can go into any animal in the population, say it's a, a bull calf that's just been born, take a DNA sample and predict the value of his genetics for, um, say, milk production. And then if he carries really good genetics for milk production, we can start breeding from him as early as possible. And if you do this, and dairy industries around the world are very actively doing this at the moment, it will increase the rate of gain you have in milk production. So to date, around the world, about 3 million cattle have had their DNA sampled and run across these SNP chips for the purposes of working out which ones are the best ones to breed from, which ones carry the best genetics. And the technology has recently been demonstrated to double the rate of gain, double the rate of increase in milk and beef production as well. And it's now being translated into crops like wheat and corn. Another good part about the technology is it's helping us balance up uh, selection for just production, so just milk and meat production, with other traits that are really important. For example, how healthy the animals are. And this is disease resistance, um, whether they lead long productive lives or not. We can find the genetics using these snapshots through the genome that lead to cows having long productive lives. And farmers are using this technology to select cows like that, that will have healthy, productive lives. So it's really balancing up selection for straight production with healthiness, productive life, and so on. Now, another key part of the balance is the environmental impact that cattle production is going to have. We can reduce the environmental impact by improving feed conversion efficiency, for example. The amount of milk and beef produced for one kilogram of feed going into the animal. But cattle also produce methane. And the reason is linked to how they do this wonderful trick of turning grass into high value meat and milk. So cattle have this massive organ called a rumen. And what a rumen is, is really a giant fermentation chamber filled with umpteen millions of bacteria and other organisms. And this rumen allows the animal to ferment the grass into high value nutrients for the animal. So the grass goes in, into the rumen, gets fermented, provides nutrients to the cow. And you can see the size of the rumen relative to the animal. It really is a very large organ. As a result of this fermentation, methane is produced and burped up by the cow. Now, with modern sequencing technologies, what we can do for the first time is start to profile the organisms that are in the rumen. And we can start to ask the question, if we have a group of cows in the same paddock, on the same pasture, is there differences 
in their microorganism profile? Are they carrying different bugs in their rumen? And we can also measure the amount of methane being produced by these animals. So we can ask the further question, can we make a link between variation in the rumen microorganism profile and the amount of methane they're producing? Now, we've been conducting this type of research for the past five years or so, and we've demonstrated there really is a link between differences in the rumen microorganism profile that you get from DNA sequencing and the amount of methane they produce. So we can recognise a rumen that is going to produce less methane. The next trick will be to take those rumen organisms and perhaps inoculate all the cows in the herd so they all produce less methane. But that's further research. So the impact that this is going to have. Genomic selection, this technology of using snapshots through the genome to track the genes affecting milk and meat production, it's already increasing the rate of gain in milk and beef production. And we're seeing that improve by 2% now per year. That may not sound like a great deal until you realise these gains are cumulative. So this year you make 2% extra gains, the next year 4%, next year 6% and so on. So after a decade, you have quite substantial gains. The technology is also allowing us to get a better balance in our selection. So not just go hard for production, but balance that with disease resistance, uh, fertility, how long the cow stays in the herd, and general healthiness of the animals. And finally, it's leading to decreased methane emissions. So genomic selection for feed efficiency will do that, reduce the amount of feed required to produce a litre of milk or a kilogram of beef. And this new technology of profiling the rumen may lead to even further reductions. So we're looking at a decrease in emissions of perhaps 15% per decade, which is quite substantial. Thank you.